welcome back. We hope you had a really nice time at your individual parties last night and you're ready for an interesting uh, number of presentations today. Um, I'm just going to invite Brian uh, Almer back up to the stand to um, go over a little bit of housekeeping in case uh, people are coming and going today so that you know what's going to happen tonight. Brian? Uh, just a, a couple of things. The uh, Again, this is the room that will be the uh, cocktails at 5.30 and dinner at 6.30. And to remind you again uh, that uh, the Dr. Uh, Dean Quilchier's breakfast Saturday in the new research ring at the Health Science Complex for tomorrow morning, and there will be shuttles running between the hotel and the campus uh, for tomorrow, and it looks like a very good time for that. And other than that, uh, I'm, I'm glad everyone, I'm sure everyone had a great time at their Thursday night parties. It was interesting to see at Karen Shaw's house out in the, on Valley Road that the river has, uh, is flooding some areas there, but, um, but um, I look forward to a really good meeting and I'll, I'll ask uh, Dean Quacher to come up and introduce our next uh, guest speaker. I don't have to read this one. Um, John and I have known each other, well, since he, uh, since he came back to medicine, uh, into College of Medicine back in the late 80s, I think. I can't remember exactly when we were, brought you back in, but I was on staff at that time, and of course as a microbiologist uh, interacting. In fact, when I moved to the sixth floor when in the, uh, in the late, 80, uh, late 80s, uh, he took over my old lab, actually, and uh, he and uh, some of the other ID people. My wife would work. Uh, Audrey Zabitnew, who we just had a wake uh, celebration for yesterday, and my wife, who worked in the virology lab, and John just reminded me before that they did some real early uh, pivotal work, and it doesn't sound too exciting, but actually showed the value of different types of surgical gloves, plastic uh, polyethylene gloves, and protection from the AIDS virus back in the late 80s. It was one of the first studies really on that. And so. Uh, John and I have worked off and on over the years. We were sad to see him leave, but he's uh, really uh, flourished in his career going forward. Uh, seen him a few times going back and forth in his busy life. I still remember when his two boys were born. Uh, uh, now they're in college. Uh, I guess we're all getting old here. So, uh, but it's really a pleasure. Uh, I, John and I, I think, uh, had a really good working relationship and friendship going back many years. Um, and uh, as an alumnus up here, we're very proud of his accomplishments in the last few years. So he's just flown back from Switzerland. I suspect he's on a little bit of a jet lag, but it's not too bad coming back east as opposed to the other way, but uh, still. Uh, he's going to give us a talk today on maple syrup and, some, and Swiss cheese, which should be interesting, and look forward to your talk, John. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean Qualtier. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and actually I wanted to uh, thank the College of Medicine Alumni Association and the um, Reunion Committee for uh, uh, nominating me to be the uh, uh, alumni lecturer. I consider it a significant honor to come back, by, uh, be nominated by my alma mater to uh, come and speak to you today. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, I look back with many, many uh, years uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, and particularly the five years of undergraduate education is uh, probably some of the most uh, fun-filled and carefree years, although at the time I don't think I or any of my classmates realized how much fun it was, uh, you know, at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, great uh, education uh, on the quality of the education at the uh, U of S, and uh, also I would say the, uh, the, the principles and the virtues of a good, hard prairie work ethic have really uh, helped me and I suspect many of you in your careers as you've gone forward. So uh, it's been uh, delightful to be able to come back. And as I mentioned, I flew back from Switzerland yesterday. I was uh, there at some meetings and I was on the uh, international jury of the uh, Innovation Academy at a building just near the United Nations. And actually of the 40 competitors, um, uh, the top five, one was selected from Canada and it was a Vancouver person but I did notice that they were a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan. So I was very proud to be able to see. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they'll uh, make it through. I had to return here for this, so I'm not in the finals for the, uh, 
for the judging. But as many of you are aware, I, I spent a year in Switzerland. Uh, during my last 12 years, I became very involved with healthcare innovations and healthcare innovation platforms. And uh, while I was department chair in, uh, in Calgary, we developed a, a large number of healthcare innovations, including uh, the alternate uh, funding plan, uh, the use of alternate care providers, uh, central access and triage, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, 17 specialized clinics to uh, help to facilitate uh, care for patients. So um, I decided to talk about the healthcare uh, innovations. It's a little bit of a different cut for a talk but uh, we'll take you through this over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. We'll leave plenty of time for questions. And uh, I have to give my wife credit. I had a more boring title, but she said, no, make it Swiss cheese versus maple syrup. So that's where it comes in. I don't know if the combination will be that good, but um, anyway. So disclosures, uh, uh, just so you know up front, I'm a consultant and resource advisor uh, for a One Health initiative with the uh, WHO and also a member of a technical consultative group with the uh, Gypsy Network with uh, the WHO in Geneva. Uh, also have done um, consulting work for the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. Uh, I'm a member of an editorial advisory board uh, for the Canadian Pharmacists Association. I've been uh, uh, done uh, speaker uh, work for uh, Janssen Ortho and Pfizer. And my academic uh, disclosures, I have funding from uh, several sources, the old AHFMR Heritage Foundation. AIHS, uh, Public Health Agency. And last but not least, I'm a very proud member of the class of 78 from the College of Medicine. <laughs> and uh, you can tell by the hecklers in the front there where they are. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, actually, uh, we were students at the time and I, I didn't realize the significance of this in the uh, Harvard Business Review in 1983. Theodore Levert, the economist and author of Globalization of Markets. Just as energy is the basis of life itself um, and ideas the source of innovation, so is innovation the spark of human change, improvement and progress. So I'm going to actually discuss that uh, today and the objectives are to uh, look at four areas that I'm going to divide my talk into. Uh, the principles of health technology innovation adoption, uh, gain an understanding of global innovation competitive, competitiveness and why Canada lags a little bit and I'll talk about the big bird intensity gap which is a major problem in Canada and actually in several of our provinces. And then to compare healthcare innovation in Switzerland versus Canada, uh, while I was there, I actually uh, was engaged part-time with the uh, WHO and the University of Geneva, and I was invited to participate in a number of the initiatives with the uh, Innovation Academy that they had been holding for a number of years uh, as part of the Swiss Innovation Platform. And I'll speak to that in a moment. Uh, it's not all about uh, watches and Swiss Army knives, as you'll uh, soon see. And then also to provide some insights into how uh, we can all look at building a healthcare innovation platform and why we each need to develop and uh, divest some of our intellectual interests into the area of healthcare innovations, be it in a practice setting or be it in a healthcare model delivery. Here's beautiful Geneva. You can see uh, the lake here, um, the German mountains in the background. Uh, Jet d'eau, our apartment was just down. We uh, had an apartment from uh, a um, art history professor who was writing a book on Paul Gauguin, and then uh, beautiful Ovive Park. Um, the key messages, so if you forget everything, I'm going to put it on the first slide. This way you can remember at least some of this, and the rest of it you can snooze through. <laughs> Firstly, uh, look at building an innovation infrastructure. Secondly, eliminate bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, interprovincial, uh, federal, provincial are one of the hugest impediments to be able to do good healthcare innovations. Uh, multidisciplinary culture, very, very important, and I'll speak to that a little later. Uh, I've worked with a huge number of individuals in areas I would have not have suspected. The most worrisome are the sociologists and anthropologists when we looked at the uh, culture of innovation change, and if you're doing new technologies, uh, the anthropologists would follow you, and I was always suspicious, why do you follow me so much? They said, that's what we do in anthropology. It's called follows. I didn't know that. Uh, create an innovation roadmap, and I'll, I'll give you an example of some of them that they have in Switzerland, and then enable uh, academic and business partnerships, and we don't do that enough in Canada. They're starting to try to do it in Alberta, but it's certainly an area that we need to look to grow upon. And then finally, uh, international uh, collaboration is extremely important because the world is shrinking. So. Uh, just an article here, um, 
to look at uh, issues surrounding adoption of new technologies, the, the, the paradox that we all realize, and that's that in the history of diffusion of innovations, you often find the overall slowness on one hand, but the fact that it's just picked up uh, by certain subpopulations on the other hand. So think of Facebook, you know, all the kids are on Facebook, and the adults are picking it up a little more slowly. That's a good example, but I'll show you another one here. Uh, and this is interesting to look at. Uh, and as I said, this is not all a medical talk here. This is the diffusion of innovations um, across the United States from about 1920s to 2000. You can see here electric service. Well, that took off pretty quickly. Um, and then refrigeration. Oh, very steep incline. You can see why that was adopted very quickly by large segments of the population. Interestingly, washing machines were not. Uh, you can see a very slow uptake. And then similarly, if you look at uh, telephones, uh, probably in the dirty 30s it declined and then it picked up. But uh, certainly, I'll show you a slide in a moment, cell phone technology has just picked up almost on a vertical axis. Interestingly, PCs in the household were slower than VCR uptake. And look at the steep incline. But then uh, you can just start to see it starting to level off. And of course, a precipitous drop of VCRs are now obsolete. So it's very interesting to look at the uh, innovations that occur uh, over time. Um, and here you look at uh, mobile phones, and you can see uh, mobile phone use. There's about 7 billion people in the world. Remember that um, China's got about 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion in, the, uh, in India. That's virtually half the world's population. In fact, in India, interestingly, I was reading recently, they have more cell phones than they have running toilets. And that's the importance that India puts on technology compared to basic sanitation. Um, and you can see here that it's picked up even faster than uh, landlines. And uh, interestingly, uh, in the EU, uh, even though they have only five or 600 million people, uh, there are almost a billion cell phones. So people own two cell phones. One is not enough. So that's the next technological issue that's occurring is people want more than one type of cell phone uh, available. And if you look at the components of diffusion, uh, you often have the uh, aggregate weighting of the incremental benefits uh, versus the cost of adoption in an environment of uncertainty. And you can think of that in your own settings. When uh, VCRs came out, when cell phones came out, mm, should I get one now or should I not? Uh, I was one of the first uh, department chairs to get a BlackBerry. I bought it 10 minutes after it came out. I had all my emails moved on to it. And then I was constantly being buzzed. I was the first person to get rid of it. <laughs> Uh, because I uh, became a slave to the uh, BlackBerry, and then I just moved to a regular uh, timing uh, interval. Um, the ultimate decision, though, is made on the demand side. As my son, who's studying economics, it's all supply and demand. And of course, the suppliers can influence that demand. Timing is a big issue when you look at uh, technology diffusion and, and the uptake of innovations. And it's usually not a choice between adopting or not adopting. That's not the question. If you think of refrigeration, you think of uh, um, uh, electricity, VCR, some of the other, it's a matter of do I do it now or do I defer? You have the procrastinators on one hand, uh, I'm going to wait for the next model uh, that will come out, uh, iPhone 5 will be here soon, then there's a delay. There's others who, like me, 10 minutes after it comes out, they're at the door buying it and uh, th then you're disappointed because the new version comes out six months later. But the key is everyone uh, makes their decision. Um, but it's better to be able to begin using because there will always be technological advances because then you can get the benefits from not only adopting the new technology, but you can also get the advantages from uh, the non-pecuniary, non-financial learning benefits. You've learned the new technology, so now you can face time with the best of them. So that's always important as well. And here's some determinants of uh, diffusion from the uh, medical side. Uh, and I can't quite read all of that, so I did print this out. This is uh, looking at diffusion of CT uh, and MR. And you can see on the one hand, and many of you will recognize this, you've got predisposing factors, which is patient demand and uh, physician wants, um, and then uh, also the purchasing power to be able to do it. And then the other hand, government and policymakers. Uh, we can only have so many MRs in the province. We can only have so many uh, uh, payments for this, but ultimately prices go down, chip technology improves, and uh, suddenly you've got new technologies. We've just invested heavily in bedside ultrasound, and uh, we've now got machines that uh, are uh, 
smaller than a small uh, mobile bedside computer and they can be used to help extend your physical exam. They're as powerful as the uh, ones that first came out that were the size of this table, if you remember the big uh, ultrasound machines. And now physicians are using them. It was once in the domain of obstetricians and ER physicians. Uh, now there's a whole uh, module for internal medicine to be able to use to extend it. And um, some of the associate deans are speaking about, let's get this in the hands of all the medical students because there's a new generation of handhelds that are coming. And the next wave is gonna be students who are uh, proficient in bedside ultrasound as an extension of the physical exam. And uh, it's, it's already happening. I've had residents in the clinic, uh, and I think I'm the ultrasound whiz, and they're there telling me uh, how uh, they're finding this and they're finding that. So it's again, uh, one of those technological innovations that is uh, coming. And if you look at 10 critical factors, this is from uh, Kadath in Ottawa, and uh, they looked at some issues about technology diffusion, you've got trialability, observability, the advantage of, of, of doing it, uh, the communication process, group dynamics, uh, the pace of reinvention, that's always important, when is the next new one coming? But that's less important because I would encourage each of you to be innovators in your own right. Pick up a handheld ultrasound, begin using it in your practice. There are uh, courses you can do over a weekend and you pick up a new skill and it actually can be a great aid in your practice to look at spleen size, liver size, is there an abscess underlying this, is there a mass, then you send them for a real ultrasound because of course uh, we're not radiologists. Um, opinion leaders and now importantly social networks uh, becoming very, very important in diffusion of uh, new technologies. Uh, infrastructure is very important as well. Uh, the ubiquitous nature of the internet uh, and having free towers uh, available is going to uh, change the pace of home delivery. And we have a big project that we're putting in with the Western Economic um, Development Corporation and, and a WEPA application later this year to look at home healthcare technology, wireless monitoring of vital signs and delivering hospital care in a home environment so that we can decrease the costs of in-hospital care. And examples of, of uh, innovations in healthcare, we often divide them into disruptive and non-disruptive. Uh, the more disruptive, the better, because then that forces you to make the changes in your own setting. So you've got uh, MR and CT, which are viewed as disruptive. Um, newer generation drugs as less disruptive. Um, PET scanning, which is a, a combination of, of nuclear medicine and CT, uh, less disruptive. Telemedicine uh, is non-disruptive. Uh, digital imaging, um, tissue engineering is more disruptive. Uh, healthcare maintenance organizations, very disruptive. Uh, talk about forming a single healthcare region in Alberta, Alberta Health Services. Uh, the jury is still out. Uh, Conference Board of Canada says that that's a sure element of uh, uh, killing innovation is to have everybody marching to the same tune. You can't make a decision because, well, somebody else has to be doing it the same way in another part of the province but that's another story and we won't get into it. Um, international innovation profiles are gonna s now move to the second part of the talk to look at um, where we can look for information. You've got the World Economic Forum, you've got uh, the uh, um, Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation Development Forum in 1960, that's the OECD, uh, Conference Board of Canada, Stats Canada, there's always issues of data integrity, but uh, it's probably the best data that we have available for us. And this is a spider plot, uh, and you can see here, I'll turn your attention actually, this is from the World Economic Forum from a couple of years ago. And this is the rankings uh, and then the scoring system for all of the uh, countries, and this is different than OECD, so this is the World Economic Forum, so 142 countries, I believe. And uh, what you're looking at is the relative ranking. Canada does very, very well, if you look over on your left, in terms of its core requirements. Great infrastructure, great health and primary care education, uh, great institutions, uh, and they rank very highly, but where they fall down is if you look at technological readiness, uh, which is down here, and then also with uh, business sophistication. Uh, we don't fare quite as well. And uh, I'll take us to the next um, uh, a plot which uh, breaks down the, the sort of readiness and you can see Canada actually does well with some parts of technological readiness in terms of having uh, internet users per 100 population, uh, 81.6, we do very well as a country. In fact, we're one of the leaders, um, broadband internet, uh, not quite as well. Uh, but then there are some areas such as technology adoption 
where we fall down, um, perhaps because of our conservative nature as Canadians, we're just not as quick as the Asians or some of the others to be able to pick it up. But um, areas that we do uh, less well here, you can see um, uh, I've looked at government procurement. This is a big issue in Alberta. I complain constantly uh, uh, to be able to look at new technologies that could be adopted uh, by governments helping out. And then also company spending and R&D. This leads to a huge uh, business enterprise expenditure gap with respect to a percentage of uh, GDP. And that's a very major issue in Canada that has to be addressed and in many of the provinces. Uh, one of the complaints that I have in Alberta is they've got some uh, SMEs, small and medium enterprise companies, they want to develop new healthcare technologies. They can't sell in Alberta because they just don't want it. They do better in going off to Europe or elsewhere. Uh, one is a washable keyboard, for example, and they want nothing to do with it. And part of it is we are one with Alberta Health Services. If we get it in one place, we have to do it for all of them, so let's strike a committee. Uh, well, they just went off to Europe to try and sell it. Uh, but procurement's very important. We had a group that went over to Finland and they visited some of the hospitals and they had uh, Nokia, if you remember, uh, a big Finnish company. Uh, government said, well, we want to try it, so 10% of all the hospitals have to try our electronic devices in their hospitals. That's procurement, that's a government assisting because it looks so bad in a market. If your own population, you can't get your products into your own population uh, because of some bureaucratic entanglement. It just doesn't look good. And that's one of the issues that has to be overcome from a Canadian perspective. And I, I think you'll find that there are people with the Conference Board of Canada, Gabriella Prada, whom we had out a couple of years ago, said the same thing. We're really bad provincially and federally at procuring our own products from innovators and small companies that want to get a start. So if you look at the OECD 2010 report, they actually started looking at how do we measure innovation, and particularly in healthcare. And this spider plot is very revealing, and I'll, I'll dig into it a little more. Where Canada does well over on your left-hand side in terms of science and engineering degrees, uh, as a percent of all degrees, uh, highly skilled uh, uh, workers, um, and then the uh, uh, patents with foreign co-workers. Um, so pretty good when you compare it, uh, Canada and the black, to the OECD average. But where we do very poorly is the GERD gap, which is the uh, gross domestic expenditures as a, a percentage of a gross domestic product, and the BIRD gap intensity. We do very poorly here, and you can see we're way below the uh, uh, average of the OECD countries. There's t uh, 20 of them, uh, 31 now. They start out with 20. Uh, I mean, we do worse than Italy and Spain, and they have very poor economies now, but that's an area that is a major uh, area that plagues the Canadian uh, government and many of the provincial governments. Quebec and Ontario do a little better. Uh, BC is still below average, but most of the rest of the country uh, not very good. Uh, and that's the business uh, enterprise expenditures as a percentage of GDP. And the next slide shows you uh, graphically uh, where we're at because the U.S. is at almost 2%. Uh, Canada's at 1%. Here's Canada. Here's the um, average uh, with the uh, OECD countries, the 31 of them, which includes Greece, Spain, Italy. Uh, they don't have particularly robust economies, yet they outstrip Canada and many of our provinces uh, with respect to the business expenditures on R&D. And part of it is... Uh, at the root of our government who are using a system of tax credits for new businesses uh, to be able to move forward, but they're starting to wake up and eliminate that now, and I'll go into that in a moment. And if you look at firms collaborating uh, on innovation by size, here's Canada way over on the bottom. I can't find this. Uh, here it is here, down at the bottom, and here's Finland, Belgium, many of the European countries and they just tower over Canada in terms of uh, the uh, bird intensity gap, and we have too large a gap, and it's something that desperately needs to be overcome. Um, and here, if you look at another parameter is patents per, um, and trademarks per capita, you can see that uh, ranking up number one, I just need to find my, is Switzerland. I've lost my... Uh, of power, but Switzerland is up at the top, towers in every year for five consecutive years, and they've found a way to be able to renew themselves. Canada sits here, middle of the pack, but 
below Belgium and Finland and uh, many of the Scandinavian countries, and we could do a lot better. But little tiny Switzerland per capita has more trademarks and patents. And uh, you think of the Swiss Army knife, uh, they were competing with China because if you remember, there were Chinese knockoffs. Uh, where they produced them is in a small village in the mountains of maybe six to 10,000 people. Uh, but then they decided they're a landlocked country and they organized themselves to be able to find a better product. And in the last five to 10 years, they've renewed their market in Swiss Army knives and now they own it again and they knocked off the Chinese who are coming up with a lot of Swiss Army knife imitators. Uh, and basically it was just through uh, quality improvement and having a better product. So, uh, and I have a really nice Swiss Army knife as I'm sure most of you do. Don't get the Chinese knockoffs, they're not as good. And here's to look at the patents per um, uh, 100 here in the population, and you can see uh, where the uh, areas are in Japan, uh, and then the Scandinavian countries, Central Europe. And you can see here the patents and trademarks, and we did a cutaway in the um, Prairie Provinces. You can see Winnipeg, uh, or sorry, Saskatoon, um, actually Winnipeg and Brandon, uh, BC and then uh, Calgary and Edmonton. So those are the hubs out in the uh, Prairie Provinces in terms of uh, patents and trademarks. And then here's firms with national and international collaboration. Canada does poorly. We don't send our students abroad. Our companies don't do enough work abroad uh, in other areas. And you can see where Canada sits uh, here. Again, uh, bottom of the pack. Uh, can do better. So realigning for success in Canada, there's a new framework in 07. So the federal government's trying to do something about it. Mobilizing science and technology for Canada's advantage. They've got a, um, a system to try and improve private sector investment in R&D. They've got some new practical research applications with national centers of excellence and then centers of excellence for commercialization and research. There's one in bioengineering. I was a part of an applicant for, for a 10 to $15 million. We didn't get it, but nonetheless, you go back and try again. Um, uh, a call for increased collaboration uh, with higher education institutions by the Canadian Council of Academies in 09. I'm a member of the Canadian Academy of Health, um, Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, and uh, they really want to be able to see this. And one of the things that we don't do is have enough of that collaboration. So for example, does the University of Saskatchewan and uh, its College of Medicine or Pharmacy uh, do they have a lot of companies that they work with on projects? Do they have students floating between them? If the answer is no, you've got a long ways to go and you can improve that setting. The Jenkins report in 2011, some of you may know about, uh, they want to reduce the funding model whereby you decrease the science, uh, research and education tax credits in favor of venture capitals funding and research assistance program. That's going to go a long ways because Canada and that many people believe this was why we had the bird intensity gap that we did. And a couple of points to make about trends and articles in science and engineering. The day of the single investigator is almost gone. You can see here um, domestic co-authorship. Uh, you can see here um, uh, single author papers are steadily plateauing and declining. Um, single author papers are steadily declining. But what's creeping up is a multinational co-authorship, an institutional, cross-institutional. You have to start working with other individuals because you can do bigger, better science or bigger, better technological applications. So you have to reach out well beyond uh, where we did. The world is far more complex now. And if you look at some of the clusters where, where things are going to happen, this is a, a, a heat plot map. And you can see some of the areas uh, here at the bottom are in um, the area of, of, of particle physics. Um, you've got your synchrotron here in Saskatoon, um, nanotechnology, and then there's a big cluster here because a lot of new drugs are going to come in through nanotechnology. And you've got here an area of um, cancer biology, immunology, and genomic medicine. And that age is coming very, very quickly and it's going to change the face of the way you do things and including PCR diagnostics. It's going to be a revolution and it's already started. The World Economic Forum in Davos this year, uh, which our Prime Minister attended, we live in the most complex, interdependent, and interconnected era in human history. No two maybes about it. Uh, and it's uh, transformational opportunities that we can move into. Canada can be well positioned to do it. 
And here's why Switzerland ranks number one. Uh, this is based on my own observations and those of a reporter from the uh, uh, Globe and Mail. Um, you can see that they're located in the heart of Europe. They've got a government that supports innovation. Uh, they developed in the 90s a, a, a national innovation report, a white paper. Um, they have low, low marginal taxes. Uh, they've got very good infrastructure and good communication and transportation. They value hard work, Swiss timing. Um, uh, they have innovation roadmaps for young entrepreneurs who want to start a company or get into the business. They have a highly educated workforce, but so does Canada. Multidisciplinary culture, they're very multidisciplinary. Um, they've got good political uh, stability, which we do in Canada, and they have clusters. So Metatronic, many of you know the pacemaker company is in Lausanne. They're uh, almost interconnected with the University of Lausanne, uh, and that's what you need to be able to do is because you get that cross-fertilization between companies and original investigators, and many times uh, commercial spin-offs that occur, or you get combined um, uh, degrees in, in technology and an MBA or a PhD and an MBA for example. They have a well-organized system and I can tell you the uh, Swiss heaven and hell joke uh, in a moment. They have PhDs and MBAs embedded in the healthcare system so I was running into people in the uh, University of Geneva hospitals and they were MBAs and PhDs and they would seek and find, they would go to talks, they would go and then they would come up to someone, that's great uh, project that you've got. Uh, we would like to get you involved with something. And sometimes for ideas, I remember attending one, uh, the group was working on a system whereby you could, uh, for people with locked in syndrome or, or paralyzed, you could use eye blinks on a computer and a camera's capturing it and then uh, it could start to move a mobile arm to assist the paralyzed patient. Or of course, the business people who were coming said, that's a great opportunity, but what we really want is the gaming industry. Just think if those kids can be doing something with their eyes and their hands at the same time. It's going to revolutionize. And you know what? That's what you need is people who have got other ideas to bring forward. And then they see an opportunity and suddenly there's two new businesses. Heck, I wanted to buy shares immediately when I heard it. I thought, yeah, geez, those kids, the way they play, you just take them off. Um, proactive Seek and Find, I mentioned. They have uh, innovation academies and then they roll up to a regional and a federal competition, and then government uh, leaders that proactively participate in the process as well. And so um, just think of the, the, the organization in Switzerland. If you think of, of a European uh, heaven, it's where the, all the policemen are British, the, the mechanics are German, uh, the cooks are French, the lovers are Italian, and everything is organized to a T by the Swiss, like Swiss timing. <laughs> European hell, on the other hand, is uh, all the police are German, the mechanics are French, uh, the cooks are Swiss, um, and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, organization is done by the Italians. <laughs> so they also have nonprofit organizations to foster innovations, and they have multiple awards, some pro bono, some with strings attached, and some with startup packages to allow young investigators uh, to be able to move forward. And they also assist in establishing partnerships. So they have offices in the hospitals, in the healthcare institutions, and uh, they will proactively go out and say, hey, let's connect you with another group and see maybe you guys want to start thinking about starting a business uh, and see what you can do with it. Uh, they also uh, foster multinational collaborations. They're a small country, so they have to seek uh, uh, other collaborators. Uh, they uh, set up business incubators in each of their cantons, which is their uh, cities and surrounding areas. They try to actively link angel investors and venture capitalists. And they certainly encourage the uh, um, relationships. So building the healthcare innovation platform, and these are some of my original thoughts, and I presented this to our vice president at our university, uh, and I think uh, if government wants to hear it, I'm happy to extend it. Uh, build your infrastructure get rid of your bureaucracy, establish your multidisciplinarity, establish the uh, roadmaps for young entrepreneurs, uh, uh, build up incentives for academic business partnerships, uh, and encourage international collaborations. So for infrastructure, collaborate with the best innovators, bring them in. We brought the Swiss group in and Swiss Next uh, two year, uh, a year ago, and we had a huge conference and said, what are you doing that's so great? How can we emulate what you're doing? 
Uh, Berkeley, California created a center for open innovation. They bring all the people from the university, the tech schools together, and uh, they have a, a session whereby they get groups together to start talking about what we can do differently. Establishing a teaching program. You can teach innovation through your business schools. We're trying to establish a system to teach innovation to our medical students. How can you build a better practice? How can you do something uh, better uh, in terms of building a better mousetrap? Uh, here was a conference that we held. Uh, this was the Innovation Now. We tried to even develop an innovative um, poster to uh, capture attention. Hopefully you like it. Um, engage your business schools. You have the Murray Edwards School of Business. They should be part and parcel of the health sciences building and the health sciences faculties to try and engage those individuals. We've uh, now got someone embedded in our Ward of the 21st Century Initiative who is with the uh, Haskane School of Business and we've also started a, a combined graduate program between the business school and our healthcare uh, um, applications. Applied research centers, uh, not only at your academic, your universities, your technical schools as well. For example, I went over and did the SAIT training course for a week, very intensive. The physics almost killed me on ultrasound, uh, but they're the ones that are coming up with the new gimmicks on the uh, probes on the ultrasounds, not the academics. So you need your technical schools as well. Uh, use your uh, design thinking to uh, transform your technical schools, universities. Um, establish boot camps. This is where you have competitions where you bring in, in a weekend uh, and you have to have a business person, a science person, uh, a sociologist to look at the sociology of the marketing uh, and you put the group together and they have to come up with an idea, they present it and by Sunday evening you present uh, the winner. But it has to be multidisciplinary and we're just establishing those now so you bring all these people together. And it's amazing when you get people from very disparate backgrounds what they come up with, it's often very ingenious. Um, liaise with innovation organizations, uh, use a uh, seek and find philosophy, partner with city planners, which they've done in Switzerland, to uh, uh, establish partnerships with groups within the city. You've got Kamenko, for example, uh, that you could do that. You want to be able to look at uh, eliminating bureaucracy. Uh, work with your ethics offices because uh, it's a big issue with ethics uh, when you uh, have to wait for six months. You've got to be able to have good ethics, but you have to break down the barriers to be able to move it forward. Promote creation of innovation clusters. You've got great opportunities here in Saskatoon, I believe. Um, to be able to do that uh, with your uh, technical schools and universities and then many of your industries that you have. Um, you can look at creating the multidisciplinary where science conversion converges, business emerges. Create a multidisciplinary environment. Bring people together from sociology, anthropology, nursing, engineering, pharmacy, science, nanotechnology, chemistry, uh, and make, force them into a room and start talking projects because that's where uh, the rubber hits the road and you really come up with some very novel opportunities. Uh, you can create funds whereby only you can apply if you've got s four different disparate disciplines that apply to it, not just a single one. Here's a road map. Uh, they've done this in Switzerland. Uh, the uh, Le Jeu uh, de l'Oi de l'Innovation, which is Basically, the game of innovation is like a monopoly board. But if you're a young person, they often complained in Switzerland, I don't know where to go. What they did is they gave them this booklet and a board that gives them a step-by-step -step monopoly-like board to tell them how they can go about and even form a company if they like. So they're fostering the ability to be able to innovate. Um, academic business partnerships. Again, I mentioned your Murray Edwards School of Business should be part and parcel of your health sciences faculty. Very important to be able to do. Um, work with federal provincial governments, again, to reduce the bird intensity gap, which I've talked about, um, and reduce uh, incentives uh, to uh, targeted approaches to innovation and encourage uh, public sector procurement of uh, homegrown industries. So procurement, very important, and I made that point earlier. International collaboration, your students should be coming uh, from afar. You should be sending your students out, uh, set a, uh, program whereby 10% of all students must spend uh, six months of time in the US or in Singapore, or Hong Kong, or one of the uh, uh, developing areas in the world, India, Brazil, where the economies are very hot, bring the ideas back to be able to try and establish those collaborations. 
some examples. So we just published uh, uh, a white paper here on um, fostering new uh, innovations that's based on the International Forum. And then Clonexus is a uh, sort of linking incubator uh, that was formed in Alberta. But in the wisdom of the Alberta government, they shut it down <laughs> with the last budget. Uh, so I'm not going to spend time. It was a good idea, though. And then finally, I'm just in closing, it's at Geneva again. Here's uh, the Mont Blanc Bridge, the United Nations, uh, La Salève, which I scaled three times actually up this cliff face with the help of a Swiss guide. And then my wife in our apartment, uh, uh, which um, uh, was uh, overlooking the Jetto. And finally, I had the opportunity to visit Albert Einstein's apartment. It's in Bern, and in a small apartment, he started a mathematics club. And from there, they developed the uh, theories of relativity. And uh, it's very humbling to see what uh, he did in an area uh, with very little resources, but he had some very bright people. And they started writing equations out. And then a few years later, he published his groundbreaking theory of relativity. And uh, it's a very small apartment. He often spoke of innovation, and he said, if at first the idea is not absurd, there's no hope for it. So those of you who have got zany ideas, we want them, move them, bring them together. Thank you for your attention. We have lots of time for questions. So does anyone have any questions for Dr. Connolly? Uh, Dr. Connolly, I enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, it's been my limited experience uh, that uh, great development starts with a seed a long, long way back. What happened in Switzerland to direct them so profoundly in this, in this uh, area? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so if you plant a seed, you need lots of water fertilizer, and I think those same uh, uh, metaphors apply. They have um, their city clusters, uh, they had their linkages between industry, uh, what they had, uh, and if you think of Glencore, which bought out Viterra, that's a good example for Saskatchewan, or um, uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals in Basel, Switzerland, or uh, Metatronics, which makes all, most of the world's pacemakers, they linked with the universities and their technical schools, and then they helped foster a highly trained professional uh, workforce that would cross between the different settings. So, um, and then they also had the ability to be able to, uh, to link those and had a, a fostered an infrastructure, and then as I mentioned, a seek and find philosophy where if there were seminars being presented at the tech school or at the university, they had people going to them. It wasn't they had to call the Office of Innovation. The innovators came to them and said, you've got a great idea. Uh, we'll use it for the paralysis victims, but we're also taking it to the gaming industry, and here's how we can do it, and then establish the roadmap. So I think it's a little bit more of a proactive <laughs> approach, but they also set the infrastructure up and the ingredients. I believe... Um, actually firmly that we have that same opportunity in Canada, particularly uh, in the West with the cooperative uh, spirit that we uh, have held near and dear for many, many years. You just start forming, uh, in essence, what a co-op was in the farming communities, but on the technological uh, academia and innovation side to be able to move that and bring those people together. And, um, you know, build it and they will come. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful talk. One of the things I was wondering about is, uh, is in regard with, with technology and partnerships is in regard to patient confidentiality. And I, I, we're, we're trying and we're, we're just beginning the process, for example, of starting a provincial diabetic foot pathway. And one of the concerns we have is, is access to photographs to help improve. And you talked about telehealth, uh. but in terms of uh, patient confidentiality yeah, no, I, to, to look at things. Uh, 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 can you address that for us? Yeah, you know what? Hire the dam busters to get through that because um, you remember World War II with the dam busters. I ran into this some years ago. I, I just refused to accept it. We wanted to look at um, follow-up for diabetic foot infections and there was, well, you can't put a picture on because there's a photo. You know what? You have to get past that. 
Uh, there are privacy laws uh, and privacy impact assessments, but you have to get past it, do the assessment. Uh, you can code them or link them somehow uh, through a third party, but you need to be able to have that because if you say we can't do it, then suddenly uh, you don't march forward. So again, there are ways to be able to get through that. That's, uh, you hit the nail on the head, and thank you for that. Uh, uh, those are the bureaucratic impediments that will allow you to uh, uh, just embroil yourself in mediocrity. You must move past that because the vision to be able to create a uh, province-wide database to be able to look at those does require photographic evidence. So you must find a way through it uh, and continue to press the policymakers and stress the importance of doing it because the outcomes will justify the means at some point down the road. So you have to be patient because there are people that will put up the roadblocks for privacy, but uh, there is a way to be able to get through that. And many medical records now are using that. Um, and at least in Alberta, one thing they got through was to use uh, NetCare, which is a province-wide database to be able to look at. And then each person has to sign a province, a privacy uh, assessment to be able to make certain they're not going to be sharing the information. So there are ways around it. There are jurisdictions who have gone past that. I would encourage you to seek those jurisdictions and try to work through each of them because it is the right thing to do. Thanks, uh, Dr. Connolly, for your presentation. Um, I do have some concerns about the potential perilous path of uh, university industry collaboration. Um, in that, um, I, you know, I have been to some, some presentations by researchers who have talked about how some of their research, they've been told that if they can carry on in this, in this um, area that uh, they were no longer going to be receiving funding because it was kind of going counter to uh, other interests. Um, my, my concern is also that, um, that, that industry and uh, uh, shareholders' profits aren't always on the same uh, same direction as uh, good health care outcomes. No, the uh, great points you've raised, and uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, there are ways to be able to try and bridge the gap uh, when you're looking at that, because you will have a tension. And in fact, if you didn't have that tension, uh, I would suggest there's something wrong, because you're right. Companies are interested in lining their uh, pockets of their shareholders, and sometimes you do run into the um, conflict. But that's a healthy tension that should always exist. You can sometimes pair off specific areas that might be a technological advance to be able to move something forward, but without uh, destroying the uh, good that might come out of something. Uh, and that's where you have that resting tension uh, and where individual investigators need to protect their intellectual property. So you need to have some protection of the intellectual property so the companies don't grab it, uh, run off with it, and then suddenly you see it on another front and you're paying through the nose for it when it should be something for the public good. And I, I do agree with you, but you can often actually split things into uh, separate components, and then you look at the ones that might be uh, company-oriented, uh, uh, and then uh, others that might be for public good-oriented, and then you work to try and protect your uh, intellectual property on the ones that are for the public good. Yeah, enjoyed the talk. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are in the patent uh, aspect, because it seems like if you want to get an investor, you have to have a product that's protected intellectually. Otherwise, they're not going to put money in it because someone else can, like the Chinese, can come along and copy it. But uh, I don't know, I've kind of got an interest in batteries and that now. But uh, if you go to scientific meetings, uh, there's a real problem, and it seems to be accelerating, that uh, scientists will not share information. And uh, as much as we're connected, um, they're very protective. When they present a paper on, on, mm -hmm. on something that's innovative or new, they either don't present all of the material, they present only part of it, they, they actually present it in a way where other people cannot use it. Because if they do present something new without having it protected, someone else is going to pick it up and use it. And it seems like it's a real dilemma and that, that y you need a patent, but in order to have patents, you can't share information. And it, it, I'm not sure how you deal with that. Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, that, uh, that's a 78 question. Um, and it's going to be difficult to answer. Uh, one um, method around, and it, what you've said is completely accurate. People will withhold information. But um, what you have to be, uh, one process is to be able to take the components of what you're working with and then set up the, uh, the, the the collaboration. And you're correct, you have to work, and patents take a long time. I hold a patent, and uh, it took so long, I thought, I don't want to go through this again, but you have to be able to do it. But that's where cutting through the bureaucracy 
uh, is important so that you can get uh, the speed and the speed with which you can bring that forward is very important. Uh, but you mustn't be scared to be able to bring forward uh, an idea or a concept uh, because if you think that you're protecting something that no one else in the world knows about, somewhere else in the world of seven billion people, they're working on it, trust me. And oftentimes it's the speed with which you can move that forward. So uh, one of the strategies is to be able to cut the bureaucracy, to be able to move the uh, innovation forward and then to set up uh, a system whereby you have uh, confidentiality agreements that people sign to be able to protect the, uh, the interests so that you don't get um, espionage. But as you're aware, it does occur. I think there was that movie about the Facebook guy. He actually stole the idea from someone else. Uh, but there's a lot of steps to be able to go through uh, uh, in between. So number one is protect your intellectual property. Uh, and that's not so tough to be able to do, particularly if you've got institutions or other groups. And then secondly, uh, uh, to try and move it through the system. And I, I think that's the most important, is the speed with which you can move it forward. Uh, easier said than done, because uh, patents can take a long time to be able to do it, but uh, it's really organization and speed with which you can move it through the system that will overcome uh, uh, that issue. But do not be afraid to take it forward, because if you do, uh, you'll get scooped by somebody in China or Asia or India or somewhere else, because believe me, the world, is very interconnected and very uh, small now. So, uh, and it's oftentimes when I come up with something I thought was a great thing in a paper, and by the time I'm getting it through in the journals, somebody else has already published it. And so speed becomes important. In a matter between ethics and, 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 and money, uh, I have a couple of comments. India discovered really rapidly that people who had cheap access to ultrasound units uh, had an incredibly high abortion of females. So did China. So there's a lesson that's been learned in another couple of continents about you know, inexpensive ultrasonics in the hands of whoever. But the more important thing, uh, and I agree with what you say about keeping government you know, and bureaucracy out of the problem because they create an, an overburden uh, amongst themselves that doesn't allow anything to trickle down and get done. But there's something that goes back way further in all of us, and uh, it's a symbolism I was b brought to by an interesting person a few months ago. The caduceus. Mm. There are two caduceuses. One has a single serpent, and one has a double serpent. The one with the single serpent is the caduceus for medicine. The other one is for the banks. Thank you for that comment. You're welcome. I hadn't realized that. Thank you, Dr. Conley, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I was wondering if the Swiss had any special recipe to avoid the conflict between uh, the researchers, the innovative uh, ideas, and uh, just the industry. Was there anything that you gained in Switzerland that uh, you could bring back to uh, help uh, this conflict between research and trying to patent your intellectual ideas and then avoid industry from taking yeah. over? I think one of the areas is to be able to look through at the angel investor community because <coughs> I've uh, worked with some things with some biomedical engineers on, on wireless monitoring of temperature and um, they were very reluctant. We actually talked about going to uh, venture capitalists and. Uh, the problem with venture capitalists is they feel that they want to own you and then suddenly as an independent researcher you want to take your uh, uh, direction uh, you know, and move it forward in a way that's going to uh, ethically provide a product. One of the concerns we had was the reliability of the wireless monitoring. So we took it into the ICU and did a study to show how it matched with core body temperature because there were some companies that had wristband temperature monitors and well who's ever heard of taking temperature at a wrist? You know, it's going to always be off. It's a peripheral uh, part of your limb. It's going to be a little less. Uh, and that's where you run into some difficulties because if you took it to venture capital, suddenly they're wanting to use wireless monitoring in an area that is not uh, as ethically sound as you might like. Um, and so 
to be able to get uh, around that, uh, I think staying away from the venture capitalists is one. The angel investor community is more intermediate, and they'll give you a little bit more freedom. So going the angel investor route, uh, and there are big communities of angel investors in most of our major cities, they're a little more kind and will cut you a little more slack as opposed to pure venture capitalists who are more interested in um, moving something uh, forward in a, uh, in a fashion whereby uh, uh, they want to feel that they're owning you and setting the direction of the work that you're doing because that's very frustrating to the individuals who are wishing to be able to pursue uh, the logic of their research in that regard. So it's often, again, a, a conflict. If you've got a big enough group, you can take it down both routes. But um, many times, if you're just a smaller group of individuals, you have to go. And so I would suggest the angel investor route. Uh, thanks very much for the stimulating uh, conversation. I'm, I'm not sure if there's answers to what I'm about to try to get you to reflect on, but I'd appreciate your wisdom on a couple things. So we're a young country that really has no I mean, we share the border with the U.S., but we don't have that same intense local competition that exists in Europe. And I sense that we're in an era where our children are being taught that competition, which is part of innovation. I know you need the teamwork side, but competition is actually a bad thing. Our children aren't being given first place ribbons anymore. They're being given um, participation ribbons. So we're in an era where being competitive against your peers is seen as a bad thing and being the ultra successful is actually frowned upon. So any reflections on how you foster the, the champions of innovation in that current societal change? Yeah, no, that's a great thought. Uh, healthy competition can be just that healthy. And actually, if you look at the Swiss culture, they're a very reserved group. They are not like Americans, you know, the unabashed. Uh, they, they actually share a lot of the same uh, cultural infrastructure that we do. They're, 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 they're risk averse. Uh, they like to cloister in their watchmaking and their banking industry traditionally. And uh, they're not your slap in the back, happy go lucky American type personality. Uh, so, but what they've done is to be able to establish that infrastructure and the connectivity and a relative degree of, uh, of, uh, of trust. Now, we had a big discussion on this exact point uh, that you can't transcribe a culture from one setting to another. But from the competition perspective, um, I think having um, innovation fairs, that's one of the strategies that we've used is to s establish <coughs> a innovation fair. We are now working towards an innovation sort of academy, but an innovation fair is simply that. It's a fair, uh, much like everybody can come out and present their best apple pie and you taste them all and well, they're all good or have a little bit different flavor to them, but it's a fair so that everybody comes out and uh, are able to present, but people pick up ideas and they interact at the innovation fair to be able to do that. So there are other ways to do it. And even if you did move towards, we want to present uh, you know, the um, honorable mention for the best five I innovators at the innovation fair. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And even uh, moving towards uh, creating some healthy competition um, uh, because perhaps the pendulum swung too far the other direction where uh, everyone has to have a participation uh, uh, ribbon. You know, uh, at the end of the day, that recognition can sometimes go a long way towards stimulating someone to be able to uh, form a company or to move forward in that regard. So two, two processes. One is innovation fairs where everybody fairly uh, can present their stuff, but you have a, an open center for innovation and interaction. And then secondly, uh, just uh, move through the participation aspect and uh, actually uh, look at having a format in which you can recognize the best innovators uh, at this point in time. Uh, one of the things that we have done uh, in planning an innovation academy is we encourage people that if they don't win this year, uh, we provide tips to them and say, come back next year because you're gonna have a more polished product uh, based on the uh, parameters that you need to be able to do. But nothing wrong, in my opinion, with healthy competition. Don't run away. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Conley. It's always a pleasure having you come back to Saskatchewan. I found that uh, a very thought-provoking, and we would like to remind you that the door is always open to come back and help us with our roadmap. So we have a small gift in appreciation. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you.